Okay, so let me, let me get here. Oh, I'm just going to show you this. Hopefully we will be cracking on. There you go. So as I said, this is an infection um, control and prevention webinar now. Um, it's based on a level two award for our MVQ. This is something that we normally deliver to social care staff. So people are actually working um, in home care by and large. So um, what we've done is we've taken some of the things out um, and added a couple of things in um, to make it um, uh, more um, uh, appropriate to you as a, as a home carer. So um, sorry if there are things in that you either know or you do or don't know and don't need to know but um, we'll try and make it as comprehensive as possible and we should have you out of here in an hour um, at the very most so just to move on hopefully this is these things are there we go so just in terms of the aim of the course really this is just to provide you with the information that you need to minimize prevent and control the spread of infection in your home um, we're going to go through a few things i'm just going to move myself here um, we're not going to identify legislation and national policies this is not something you need to know we will look at the causes of infection and methods of control we'll talk to you a little bit about number three which is explaining safe practice and the use of personal hygiene we won't be describing your employer employee responsibilities because you don't need to know that um, we will be talking a little bit about understanding the principles of risk assessment in, inf in infection control Okay, so that's basically what we're going to be looking at. I mean, we're going to be covering what we think are some of the essential knowledges, the understanding that you need. So we'll be talking about sources of transmission of infection, um, talking about risk, talking about personal hygiene practices, washing the hands. You'll have heard a lot about that, talking a little bit about food preparation, standards of cleanliness, dealing with bodily fluids, something around sharps as well, although that won't be appropriate to all of you. <laughs> and something around dealing with infectious waste so i think we'll be covering pretty much all of the all that you need um just uh, some of the basics around infection and colonization i mean systemic infection number a there or number a letter a um we all know about systemic infection It's one of those things where you have an infection and, and it impacts on your whole body if you talk think about the flu um it's not localized you quite often have a headache you may have um, aching body you may even feel a bit slightly nauseous um sore throat so that's a systemic infection localized infection good example of this is if you cut your hand um, it goes a bit nasty and you've got pus coming out of it there's a localized infection it's restricted to one area only um, colonization as the presence of organism on our body but it's not causing us illness and this is one of the big things for us at the moment obviously it's about all of those people we're worried about who may be infectious with regard to the coronavirus but don't know about it yet um, not caused uh, not ill yet but maybe infecting other people and then lastly a little bit on infestation that's sort of like being overrun that tends to be about pests or parasites i mean you know a good example of that is if you have children they've had head lice at school so um, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about there um just briefly talk about some of the sources and causes um around infection i mean there's some obvious sources and i think we'll talk about some of these um a bit a bit more um if you take sneezing a clear source of infection um you know you may have seen the slow motion video of somebody on the tube where they sneeze and you see the water particles fly out of their mouth seem to go about two meters um and there's coughing that's the big one at the moment talking and kissing sexually transmitted um source of infection and of course you know we can get them from contaminated food and water we all know that barbecue season while it's not around the corner um tends to you tend to find many more things like e coli um norovirus and that tends to come from undercooked chicken and food like that now obviously there we know the causes there are the bacteria um uh, fungi um tend to be things around sort of like athletes foot thrush and things like that viruses the big one at the moment again we're talking about parasites so um i mentioned head lice earlier um just a little bit about bacteria uh, bacteria 
um, also known um, for those of you who watch a lot of television, pathogens, um, germs that we call them. It's sort of like, you know, there's some things we know about bacteria. Firstly, they need food, they need moisture, they need warmth, and they need time to grow. Um, and, you know, these are, these are, these are the types of things that um, if you go to the doctor, if you've got bacterial inf infection, your doctor will think about giving you antibiotics or things like that, which they won't give you for a viral infection as they don't have any impact. So, you know, some of the diseases caused by bacteria, across here, tetanus, tuberculosis, whooping cough, gastroenteritis, the big one we know, urinary tract infections, food poisoning. That's the sort of like the bacteriological sort of infections. Um, if we think about viruses, um, these are sort of like viruses enter the cells of other living beings. They're out, they enter our cells and they reproduce. Some common examples um, of viruses and HIV, mumps, measles, hepatitis, common gold. You'll notice certainly with mumps and measles and indeed hepatitis, one of the big things with uh, the way we've fought these over the years now has been through um, vaccinations, which is why there's such a drive at the moment to come up with some form of vaccination for the coronavirus. Um, and of course, the common cold, which we cannot find a vaccine for at the moment, although we do um, vaccinate against certain amounts of flu flu viruses so they're viruses fungi the uh, fungal infections they tend to be thrush ringworm um, athlete's foot um, those things where you've got sort of um, basically sort of like a fun, yeah, fungal infection okay so just to talk about sort of like the microorganisms uh, if we must um, it's always worth thinking uh, microorganisms are living things and they, they need some things to, to, to thrive and grow. And this is sometimes where we can, we can intervene in terms of stopping this. They need an adequate food source. And quite often, um, you know, one of the things is, is, is dirt, grime, stuff that you've got on your hands. They need warmth. They need moisture. Um, often they need time. Um, they need some, some need oxygen and, uh, and some need uh, shielding from direct sunlight. And, um, you know, it's, uh, we talk about those sort of warm, dank, moist places, ideal for germs. Well, these are the reasons why. Yes, they are absolutely ideal for germs and something that we need to try and avoid um, if we can. So we want to, um, sorry, I'm going to go back to that. So we, you know, we want to avoid giving them an adequate food source. We want to avoid the moisture and the, 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 that, that kind of thing. So we really do need to, to like, see if we can break into those, those kinds of things. Um, we'll talk a bit about the sort of um, uh, breaking the infection cycle in a little bit. Um, here's just a couple of um, uh, definitions. One, of course, of, is disease caused by microorganisms. We've talked a bit, a bit about that. And of course, they, you know, the idea of disease is they cause an impairment to your health. Now, obviously, the, the thing we're talking about at the moment is communicable diseases, especially with the coronavirus. Um, and these are diseases that are usually transmitted from person to person, through person to person contact. That can be, you know, through the shared use of contaminated in instruments or, or, or materials, or indeed, as we spoke about, sneezing, coughing, which is why we're in a, uh, a, a position now where we're being asked to, asked to socially isolate. Um, just to... Just to run through a few of the, the infectious diseases. Normally we give these and say, here's some examples of infectious diseases. This doesn't seem that necessary at the moment, but you've got C. diff there, you've got scabies, which you've all heard of, the MRSA, which is the, um, the disease that, um, that has developed antibiotic resistance um, and is something that they worry about a great deal in hospitals um, and one of the reasons why doctors are very um, wary about giving antibiotics where they don't need to. Norovirus, um, you know, main symptoms, diarrhea and vomiting. Most families, most individuals have suffered from norovirus at some point. Um, and one of the things is, is we, we know how quickly it can spread. Um, you know, it's not unusual in, in, a, in a family if one person comes home with a norovirus before a day or two has gone by, the whole family's down with it. And then the last one we've got here is HIV, HIV I should, should say, human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and, you know, and obviously 
not included on this list, but very much in, in the forefront of our minds now is the coronavirus or COVID-19. So just um, again, this tends to be, uh, if you were doing this course um, with us um, in, in our center, we would do this in an interactive manner, um, but we're gonna have to run through them. So factors that increase infection. So low immunity or defective immunity. Some people are immunodepressed um, and, and some people, and this could, this could be caused by a range of things. So for instance, um, people who are undergoing radiotherapy or chemotherapy from, for cancer um, may have very low immunity or have, um, have, have had their um, immunity um, depressed and that, that makes you much more susceptible to um, infection. Long-term antibiotic therapy, if you've been on antibiotics for a long term, um, if because of whatever um, uh, disease or illness you have, that can make you um, liable to um, more infection. Poor hygiene, that's the one your mum always told you about. Proximity to others, so you know if you're in a position where you are actually um, in and around people who have infection, then that makes you more likely to get infection. And that also, um, you know, works across the fact that, you know, you might be dealing with people's laundry where there may be infection as well. Contact with bodily fluids from people who have, again, infection. Um, those people who are very sick or have had surgery uh, recently, pardon me, <coughs> are um, more likely um, or more susceptible to infection and then of course the very young and the very old and uh, you know from uh, the point of view of for instance the coronavirus very old or certainly those people over 70 we know are more susceptible and, and are likely to have um, a less favorable outcome if they or become become much iller um, if they do pick up the coronavirus so there's a number of factors um, that increase your chances of being um, or, 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 or becoming um, infected by something. So just going to talk a little bit about the roots of infection. Some of these are obvious. Um, the eyes, if you think about things like um, conjunctivitis, the mouth, the respiratory tract, one of the big things we're talking about at the moment, those issues around lungs and the COVID-19 um, virus. Um, obviously, if you, but for people who, um, I am uh, intravenous drug users and or, you know, in the past um, issues around sort of um, uh, injections for, or for um, blood transfusions. Um, that could be a root of infection, the blood, the gastrointestinal tract, your stomach, your genitourinary tract, and of course your skin. So there's a, a whole range of routes to infection and routes of infection um, that are open to the viruses and the bacteria out there. And we need to take steps to make sure that we can try and prevent and control those routes. So this here is what we call the, the chain of infection. And um, I'm going to go through this really, really quite briefly, but um, it, I think it's a really good example of how, how infection works. So um, I'm just going to use myself as an example here. So um, what we have at the top is the infectious agent. So for sake of argument, let's call it the common cold, the flu bug. Um, so we have something that is the infectious agent. We then need a reservoir. So say I've got the common flu bug, I've, I am the reservoir. I'm the person where that, um, that infectious agent is being held. But so then we need a portal of exit. So if I sneeze on the tube and I don't cover my hand and I, bah, um, my mouth is the portal of exit. Means of transmission is the sneeze. So that effectively I am spraying those germs, that infectious agent, all over the tube channel or the train um, carriage. But then, of course, that's it for me. Um, but the bugs are out there, the germs are out there, the viruses are out there. They then need a portal of entry. And that portal of entry might be to another person. And so if you're standing or sitting on a train carriage or the tube and you've got your mouth open and somebody sneezes and all of that comes along, then your mouth is actually, or your nose is a portal of entry for that bug. You are the susceptible host. Now, of course, if you're fit and healthy, you might be less susceptible. But remember, we've just talked about those people who may be more susceptible. And so that individual 
is the susceptible host now picks up that infectious agent and becomes the reservoir and thus the chain of infection goes on and one of the jobs that we need to do in terms of preventing and controlling infection is really looking at ways in which we can break that chain of infection so i'm just going to go through that um, again very quickly so what we need is an infectious agent and we've got it down here as a pathogenic microorganism as i said before if you use my example say i've got the cold or a a, a a flu bug or a, a sort of flu virus um, but that's something that's capable of producing an infection an infectious disease um, then the reservoir that's where it may uh, the, the infectious agent may spread to cause disease so you know in my example i'm the reservoir i'm holding the infectious agent the portal of exit that's a way in which the infection leaves the reservoir again my mouth spraying it over the over the uh, over the, the over the train carriage uh, the means of tra transmission um, we've got here direct or indirect contract but, uh, contact but again you know it might be you know me sneezing i think give a good example if for, for um you know i i've got two daughters and they're much older now but when they were younger they they won't they won't like me for saying this publicly but you know they ha they had some problems with head lice and spoke to the teacher and said well why do girls get head lice more rather than uh, uh, more than boys for instance he said well actually you know what they do is they get their heads together when they talk and they 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 get very close and uh, of course then the means of transmission is there their contact and then the headlines jump from one one um uh, uh, clean set of hair to another clean set of hair and there you go there's your means of transmission you need of course a portal of entry as i said you know in my in my um example that was somebody else's mouth open as i rather rudely sneezed in the train carriage and then you need the susceptible host which could be any one of you who's sat out there um and somebody who can fundamentally be infected by a communicable disease unless we are immune to that disease then we are potentially a susceptible host so that is your chain of infection and that's what we are seeking to control and that's what we're seeking to break so just looking very briefly at methods of of, of control um, around prevention of in, in infection we'll go through some of these now i'm not going to go through the ones on the right hand side those organizations involved like public health england although you know i know now know that uh, you've probably heard more from public health officials in the last um, six weeks than you would have done probably in a lifetime before on the left hand side these are things that we um, that we can do so you know there may be some standard precautions so hand washing is a standard precaution to prevent infection there might be some disease specific precautions um, that, that that you might take you might be able to get immunized for instance um, against them we talked about mumps earlier um, immunization against measles mumps and rubella has been very effective um, over over the years in this country you might look at screening which um, identifies those people who, who may be um, more likely to have infection or at the, at the moment we're looking for people who might be carrying the infection and of course you know this is all part of a risk assessment that we make when we're looking at <coughs> how we prevent and control um, infection so this is the big one here at the moment we've been talking a lot about hand washing and it's incredibly important i've coughed a couple of times into my hands and you know normally if i wasn't delivering this webinar or now i would be going out to wash my hands because that's a really important thing to do and i'll be wiping off my um my laptop afterwards as well um because i'm i'm touching these things but let's sort of talk a little bit about hand washing now um I thought the best way of um, illustrating how to do hand washing was actually just to show you a couple of videos. Now there's loads of videos out there at the moment and there's posters and you'll be seeing them, all, seeing them all over the place. But these two I particularly like. One is aimed at uh, children. So for those of you who are caring for um, children and young people, this is a good way of doing it. And then there's another one which is um, which I just liked anyway. So I'm going to do. I'm going to let you see those. They only take a, a minute or so each, and and then we'll move on because um, I think the issue is what you need to do is think about the technique. So watch the videos. Think about your technique in terms of hand washing.
Tremendous. And um, I mean, we'll go on to another one in a moment, but uh, I mean, there's a great um, uh, video that's doing the rounds on social media at the moment. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a guy, guy's got two gloves on it and he actually uh, does the hand washing technique, um, but using some form of black, um, either uh, lotion or liquid. And it just goes to show how important the technique is in order to get full coverage for this. So here's my second video. This is just maybe showing my age. It's just something I liked. I think it's from North Hants General Hospital. And again, really something that we need to keep going. And I'm sure if you're like me, you have washed your hands more than ever before at the moment, um, to the point of, of, them, of them cracking. But here we go with the second one. So thanks very much to North Ants General Hospital. And as I said, there's loads of these out there. So if you're looking for ones that are particular, um, you know, whether they're, they're in a particular language that you need or um, for somebody with maybe learning difficulties or for children or for somebody with dementia, there are loads of these things out here. So um, I think videos are a great way of showing it. But, you know, it's hand. one of the great things about, you know, infection prevention and control and a great thing about doing this webinar is that you know none of it's rocket science um, and one of the key things is, is, is you can take steps which will make a difference um, and washing your hands is one of those key steps that you can take and washing your hands often with soap and warm water is a really positive thing that you can do in terms of um, slowing down prevention uh, slowing down preventing and controlling infection so I just want to talk about because um, one of the things everybody knows is that you can't get alcohol um, gel for love nor money in the shops, although I'm sure it will be coming back. Um, one of the things I want to just say quickly is that alcohol gel is great. And with our staff, we, we, we make sure that they have it with them at all times. Um, but there's a couple of things to say about it. First off, it's not cleaning your hands really it's it's disinfecting them in a way without getting with the alcohol gel so if you've got dirt on your hands um and you use alcohol gel fundamentally you've still got dirt on your hands okay so um if you've got dirt under your nails that's not going away and this is why you know hand wash is important so before you use it make sure you've got visibly clean dry hands make sure you've washed your hands before you do it then you need to use a fair amount. Um, I know there's not a lot in the shops, but um, there's no point in being sparing about it. It needs to cover as well. So one to three shots of alcohol gel, get plenty on there. Don't use it with water. Make sure that you've rubbed it all over. And again, the technique of getting that alcohol gel around your hands is really important. Just make sure you get it on there. Um, and you know, make it and rub it until your skin feels dry, which doesn't take long with it when especially with alcohol um, gels with, with quite high alcohol contents in. Um, one of the things I didn't know before I started doing this uh, course is that uh, it doesn't doesn't really have any impact in terms of norovirus or diarrhea. So um, all of those people have been travelling around the world and saying, "Don't you don't worry, I won't get a stomach um, disorder because I've got alcohol gel." And uh, it would appear that they were wrong. Um, there's a couple of things I do want to cover quickly. 
this is something that we talk about with our home care staff in terms of sort of like poor practice in terms of cleanliness and things like that but i think you know it's worth thinking about both in the home and of course you know quite often you're you're going to be um employing home care staff as well so rings your wedding band is plain it's simple um what if it is plain and simple um and that's fine um but quite often you see rings that are fairly complicated they've got lots of bits and pieces on them and these these are these are areas in which you can you can sort of like hold infection painted nails nail extensions big nails um they get dirt underneath and they can and they're they're, they're not ideal um obviously isolation precautions we know all about isolation at the moment no PPE, the personal protective equipment. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I mean, it's probably not something um, that's quite as um, uh, relevant to you guys um, in a home situation. It's certainly relevant for our staff. But um, and I think, you know, more and more people are thinking about using rubber gloves, for instance, or an apron if they're doing specific things. Obviously, poor cleaning of equipment. If you use an equipment, it should be sterile, which wasn't well, sterile necessarily. It should certainly be cleaned. Um, and then, you know, in, in the case I said, uh, home care staff, a failure to wash their hands or change their gloves between contact. And that that's something that, uh, you know, we hope never happens, but uh, it's different from you in, in, in home care. So just a little bit about uh, PPE. You'd have been hearing a lot about this in the news. I think it's called personal protective equipment. Um, it's not, as I said, it's not something that normally you would use in the, in, in the home environment. Um, it tends to be what we tend to talk about in terms of home care PPE is, is gloves, aprons, sometimes arm sleeves. Um, pardon me. <coughs> And at the moment, um, we're talking a lot about face masks, um, although it has to be said um, a lot of what, uh, I, you know, th these things don't offer uh, offer perfect protection. Certainly it would be here that face masks don't. But um, sometimes it's worth, you know, thinking about using certainly rubber gloves and having those around the house. Um, as I said, this is just the, the, the kind of things that, that we use as, um, within, within our staff group, probably wouldn't be appropriate for you. Um, although I know that there, there has been a much of an increased demand for this kind of thing. And of course, you know, you see people um, walking the streets now um, with masks on and, uh, and that's, that, that's, that's happened also over the, the last few years in other countries. So if you go to Hong Kong, for instance, it's not unusual to see quite a few people with um, masks on since the, since um, the SARS um, a, a virus. Um, so that's PPE and it's certainly one of the things that you if you have home care people coming in doing home care for you you would expect to see them using it so um, this is largely um, oh, it's, events have overtaken us with regard to this slide so just talking about infection outbreaks and incidents so isolation used for individuals who are affected infected with or colonized by infectious agents um, we've all heard about isolation. We've all heard about self-isolation now. And we're now talking about sort of social distances and keeping away from people. And we're all becoming increasingly or in, increasingly looking at isolating ourselves. Um, major outbreak. Well, we've gone way past that with the coronavirus. We're now in the in the realms of pandemic. So we're not talking about a major outbreak anymore. Um, we are talking about a pandemic and we're certainly not talking about a minor outbreak. So um, I'm not going to spend too too much time on that there's only a few things that we've got left and I, I, I do apologize if you think this has been a bit of a whistle stop half an hour um, going through I just want to cover a few more things um, which again may or may not be appropriate to all of you but I think are, are, are worth looking at some of you for instance may use sharps in the home um, if you do use sharps um, you, you you should use for disposal you should use a recognized a designated sharps bin you'll recognize these they're yellow with an orange tops by and large um, they've normally got a lid that fits properly on and once you put the sharp into the lid or uh, through the lid or through the egg on the, the top of the lid um, you can't get it out um, and then 
you know, largely when you've got, when that's full, you need to take it either to your local hospital or a pharmacist, depending on what's um, available in your local area um, for disposal. Um, just briefly, um, again, probably not appropriate for most of you, but just briefly a little bit on needle stick injuries. If you do end up um, getting stuck with a needle, whether it's, um, you know, from um, somebody you're carrying with who's got diabetes or maybe an old EpiPen, you know, these things happen. And there's a couple of things you need to work out is that uh, it's not the Wild West here, so um, we're not talking about sucking out poison. What we need to do is squeeze the wound, get a little bit of blood running clean it under some running water, cover it with um, a waterproof dressing, a plaster from your first aid box, then really seek some medical advice. Um, you know, ideally call 111, explain what's happened and then get some advice off them. Um, it's fairly, fairly straightforward on that front. Just a little bit in terms of linen and laundry. And I know for some of the carers we work with, um, you know, the people they're, they're, they're working with, um, or the people they care for, um, quite often they, they, they end up dealing with soiled li linen and laundry. A couple of things here. Um, if you're dealing with soiled laundry, and that could include anything under soiling, you know, blood, saliva, vomit, feces, that kind of thing. Um, you know, what we're saying is if you, if, if you can, um, use some rubber gloves you know if you've got an apron and you need to pick up soil soil linen you know pick it up put it into a heavy bag or you know a black plastic bag in your case not necessarily a sleaze bag you won't have those necessarily but don't grab it here and hold it there and get soiling all over your clothes um, don't put it on the bed for later and then come back and get it so get it into a bag the key thing here is in terms of washing, um, 65 degree temperature um, for a minimum of 10 minutes um, with, within the wash cycle or 71 degrees for not less than three minutes. Now, I've done a little bit of research here and my understanding is that the majority of domestic um, washing machines will do the 65 degree temperature not many of them do the 71 degree temperature so make sure you get it in there and it, you don't put it on a, a quick wash you know make sure you get it on a decent wash now people have called in or spoken to me before and said well my i've got nylon sheets they don't work at 65 degrees um no, you're right. And my only answer to that is, unfortunately, you're going to have to go out and get yourself some cotton sheets um, that you can stick into a washing machine and wash at a hot wash. So um, that's a little bit about linen and laundry. And we're actually up to our last slide here. Um, so this is just a little bit around um, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization. And, it, you know, just a, a definition of that. And so, you know, cleaning, physical removal of dirt and organic matter. That's where your hand washing go, gets into. Disinfection, removal and destruction of an adequate number, not all, an adequate number of potentially harmful microorganisms to allow the item to be handled safely. And you, you'd have all seen the, the cleaning um, uh, liquid that says kills 99% of germs dead. Well, you know, that's not all, it's 99%. And of course, sterilization means it's a completely different step on, and that's about the total destruction, removal of microorganisms, including the spores. But let's be clear here, we're not looking at sterilization. You're not in a surgery, you're not in, a, you're not in an operating theater. What we are looking at is making sure that we're looking at cleaning and we're looking at disinfection. So making sure we can break that. Now, that has been a very, very rapid run um, through our CFQ, MVQ course on um, infection control and prevention. I hope that it's, 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 it, it's given you a, a clear idea of what you can do at home um, to make a difference to these, to these things and what you can actually do to, 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 to break that cycle of infection. And as I said, if you take away just one thing from today, hand washing absolutely essential and if you do that properly you lose you use soap you use warm water that will be that's one of the key things you can do to make a difference in 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 today's world so 
what we're going to do is we will put this up on our website. We will make it available via social media. Um, we're running a number of these over the next couple of weeks. Um, the infection control ones will be the same, um, but tomorrow we have one on managing um, pressure sores um, for those of you who are caring for somebody who may be bed bound. But all I have to say now is thank you very much for attending. Um, it's been a pleasure being able to um, hopefully um, help you with this and um, stay safe and good luck.